Those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr Michael Gannon. I'm the President of the AMA and WA uh, and I'm the Chairman of the Ethics and Medico Legal Committee. I hope you're all looking forward to this uh, session today. Uh, those of us in the committee have put a great deal of thought and work into it. Uh, very grateful to Dr Kate Stockhausen in charge of the ethics session of the AMA for helping it put it together. I hope it's going to be a really engaging and exciting session. Um, thank you for attending the 2016 AMA National Conference and this session on assisted dying. For the purposes of this session, we've referred to euthanasia and physician assisted suicide collectively as assisted dying. As you know, the AMA is currently reviewing its policy on assisted dying as part of its routine five yearly policy review, uh, just like it does with all other policies. If you refer to the outline on this session in your conference uh, handbook, you'll see the current policy in full, uh, along with the clarification of some of the terminology you'll hear today. Uh, we've made a very strong commitment to engage with AMA members as part of this review. Late last year we invited members through Australian Medicine to send us their open-ended comments on the current policy. And more recently we conducted a survey of all AMA members uh, where we received almost 4,000 responses. Uh, this survey is currently being collated and will be considered by Federal Council in the near future. The survey results will be disseminated to members after that. And as such, we will not be discussing the results of the survey today during this session. The next opportunity for member engagement in this area is this session here at National Conference, hopefully providing us with a unique opportunity to have what I hope is a, an, an intra-professional discussion on assisted dying, very much doctors for doctors, where we as doctors can discuss amongst our colleagues whether or not the medical profession should have a role in assisted dying. The issues raised during this session will also form part of the review and the considerations of Federal Council in coming months. So just some ground rules. As this is an intra-professional discussion, and although we've invited observers to come to this session because of the importance that this, this issue may have to them, questions will only be taken today from doctors and medical students. The format of the session will be similar to that of ABC Television's Q&A program. And we will similarly be using a combination of pre-selected questions and questions from the floor. There are microphones that you can see standing and there are also roving microphones that will be coming around the room. Those doctors with a pre-selected selection know who they are and they will be asked to stand up and read their question out to the panel. Uh, we'd like everyone else to stand up at one of the uh, microphones. Please keep your questions short and please ask a question rather than incur the wrath of Mr Jones who might tell you that he will take that as a comment. Uh, we'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible in the two-hour session. Uh, for those of you wishing to make general comments on the issue, uh, we have installed a Q&A system where comments can be written out and projected onto the screens uh, behind me here, uh, similar to how Twitter feeds work on the television program. Uh, the instructions are written for you there. Now, please note that the panel aren't reading these questions and they will not respond uh, to them, but it does give an opportunity for people to, uh, to engage in the session and express their opinions to other people in the audience. Now, I want to make it very clear that uh, our panel members are not AMA representatives and not spokespersons. They cannot answer a question on behalf of the AMA. Uh, with one exception, they are uh, Georgie Haysom, who will be giving us some legal expertise. They are individual medical practitioners uh, who have a, a profile and an interest in whether or not the medical profession should have a role in assisted dying. Uh, it is by design that I'm not sitting on the panel. Uh, there may be uh, questions from the floor that do relate to the process, uh, but the doctors on the panel are not here to speak on behalf of the AMA. Uh, we made a conscious decision to let debate flow freely without the influence that an AMA representative like myself might have had. Uh, finally, I probably don't need to say this, but I just ask that everyone is uh, respectful to both members of the panel and to each other. Uh, you all know that assisted dying is an extremely contentious and emotive issue, and I know that many of you in the room have very strong convictions. Uh, I'd like you now to welcome to the stage someone who many of you will recognise, if not all of you, um, uh, and turn over the session to our moderator, Mr Tony Jones. Tony's one of ABC Television's most respected journalists with more than 20 years' experience in radio and television news and current affairs. 
He anchors Late Line on Wednesday and Thursday nights. Um, Tony began hosting this award-winning news and current affairs program in 1999. In 2004, he received a Walkley Award for Best Broadcast Interviewing for a series of interviews on Late Line. And as you all know, Tony also hosts the ABC's Q&A program on Monday nights. Um, we are delighted to have him with us today. He will introduce the panellists, but uh, please make uh, Tony welcome. And Tony, I'll leave you in charge. Thank you very much indeed. I have very little to say except to introduce our panel. Um, being uh, not a doctor myself, I have to say I'm probably the only person who will be asking questions from time to time who isn't a doctor. But I'll quickly introduce our panel. I'll go straight into questions. I will, in fact, be able to see uh, comments that are made uh, by telephones. I'll try and introduce those into the discussion as well. So our panel, as they are seated, Mark is the last one to seat, associate to be seated, the Associate Professor Mark Yates uh, from Deakin University and a geriatrician at Ballarat Health Services. He's a former Victorian President of the AMA. Save your applause till the end. Uh, next to him is Emeritus Professor Bob Douglas, a retired public health academic with prior clinical experience uh, both as a general practitioner and a specialist physician. He's also a co-founder of the Think Tank Australia 21. Uh, next to me on my right is Ms Georgie Hasem. She's the head of advocacy at Avant and a medico-legal expert. On my left is Dr Karen Hitchcock. She's a staff physician at the uh, Alfred Hospital. She's also the author of Dear Life on Caring for the Elderly. And next to her on my left is Professor Malcolm Parker. He's a professor of medical ethics at the University of Queensland. He was in general practice for 30 years. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. There should be a microphone somewhere near our first questioner, Dr. Robert Ma. Will Dr. Robert Ma please stand up? We'll give you a microphone. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Uh, yeah, I've been a GP for over 36 years, and over the last few years, I've noticed a relux reluctance of some doctors to use even the traditional double effect of morphine, etc., at the end of the end of life of terminally ill patients. Uh, the reason some doctors give is that they're frightened of being reported by opponents to assisted dying, that they may have been involved in voluntary euthanasia. The New South Wales AMA has confirmed to me that several doctors a year contact them with these concerns. I'm aware, for example, of one terminally ill 80-year-old patient of mine who was dependent on, on, on an endotracheal tube and who agreed to have the endotracheal tube removed knowing she would die. Unfortunately, the ICU doctor removed the tube without any sedation in front of all the relatives and the patient suffocated in front of them. When they asked the doctor, why didn't you give us some sedation? He said, I, I didn't want to appear that I was being involved in voluntary euthanasia. This is a, this is a concern that's out there for a lot of doctors, that there, there's, there seems to have been... Well, I, I believe the discussion about assisted dying over the last few years has created a backlash with those opposed to assisted dying. Um, and this has resulted in some patients in, in terminal care not receiving the ideal care. I strongly believe it's time that terminally ill patients had the right to request uh, medical assistance at the end of their life if their suffering is too great after receiving the best palliative care. And I think it's time that we considered such models as the Oregon model, which, which involves self-administration, because this um, has no, it gets over the problems of doctors administering a lethal dose. The doctor doesn't administer any lethal dose. The dose is only available and with very strict safeguards for a terminally ill patient to self-administer. So I was wondering what the panel thought. Is this Oregon model of self-administration a policy that could be acceptable uh, in the future for the AMA as we consider this issue? Okay, let's go around the panel. I'll start with uh, Malcolm Parker. Um, I would agree with you because I'm on that side of, uh, of the argument, but I wanted just also to go back to what you said at the beginning in relation to uh, that patient, but that doctor. It's widely understood now on the basis of good evidence that, and I don't mean this to be offensive in any way, that doctors' knowledge of the law in all sorts of areas, including this one, the end of life, um, is not particularly good. 
In Queensland, there was a, uh, an act, the Palliative Care Amendment Act, which was passed, which was purely to put into legislation what was already understood to be a common law availability to doctors, and that is the double effect, use of the double effect doctrine. But they had to put it into legislation, and even in Queensland, um, with such legislation, I'm not aware of any other specific legislation, but with that sort of legislation, what you're talking about still exists. That is, doctors and other health professionals are worried that if they do what we call good medical practice um, by treating symptoms as they arise, even if that has the effect of causing death, then they'll get into trouble. That, of course, is not the case. But we still, doctors still need to be disabused of those beliefs. Malcolm, I'll come back to you um, on the question of um, the Oregon laws, because I think we will discuss that uh, as a key part of that question. But just on that very issue, and I'll bring Karen in on this as well, the AMA's current guidelines uh, do appear to allow for hastening death um, in, with suffering patients. The administration of treatment or other actions intended to relieve symptoms which may have a secondary consequence of hastening death. Um, that incidentally goes against some of the principles of palliative care. Well, no, it doesn't. Okay. That's not true. I mean, that, that, what that is saying is that we can use double effect, and double effect is just based on the the bedrock of medicine, which is that we treat symptoms. And so I, I, I completely agree with you that there is evidence that um, doctors are, or some uh, health practitioners are scared to give, you know, whatever dose of morphine because it might stop the patient from breathing. But I think that it's our responsibility to alleviate suffering in our patients. And if you need to give a dose of medicine that uh, does hasten their death in order to treat their symptoms, then that is already uh, legal and led, I mean, but making that clear in legislation is obviously not enough. It need, there needs to be education around, around that issue. I have heard uh, many palliative care doctors say it's part of their central principle that they cannot hasten death. Uh, is that not the case? Well, you, what you do, the issue is not uh, we never treat life; we treat symptoms. So um, the whole thing about hastening death is almost beside the point because what what you do is you treat symptoms, and you know death is not the cure. Getting getting rid of the the symptoms is the aim. So yes, they don't set out to kill the patient; they set out to or we set out to alleviate their symptoms, and that is that that is the aim. Can, okay. can I just sure. quickly say that the, the difference here is that of intention. So uh, if you intend to hasten death, then you are at risk at the hands of the law. If you don't intend to, to hasten death, but if you intend to treat symptoms and an incidental secondary result of that is death, then you're okay. okay. Turns on intention. Right, we've got a legal expert on the panel, Georgie Hayes. What, what's your view on this and, yeah. and the, the concerns being expressed by the questioner? Well, I think um, what Malcolm just said is absolutely right. It does turn on intention. Um, if you intend to cause someone's death, then that is under the current law, murder, um, and therefore you could be prosecuted. And that's why the law of double effect came in in relation to the use of um, medications at the end of life to reassure doctors. I would agree with Malcolm that it's about education because this has been around for um, quite a long time, I think, this doctrine at, in common law and in legislation, and yet doctors um, and other health professionals are still concerned about the implications of um, treating patients at the end of life where it might end up, or well, some people may think that it hastens death. Yeah, I'll go to Mark at the end to hear well, your view. I, I, only to add, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I, I think it is an issue of education. I, I think the issue of the, the question of double effect comes back to whether or not uh, we uh, as a profession are allowed to practice as a profession and that is valued in the community or whether we want lawyers to try and wrap up these very, very complex decisions in particular pieces of law. The AMA is very clear about its policy in relation to double effect. Good medical practice is a very safe and well-defined entity in legal constructs. And, uh, and the double effect is, is, is available and is used on a day-to-day -day basis in practice because we are trying to treat a patient's symptoms. Therefore, the concept of the Oregon legislation becomes irrelevant 
uh, in that environment. And, and I think the issue for the AMA is clearly about promoting good palliative care, understanding the existing legislation. And a lot of this uh, debate, which has been driven by a, a small number of people with a particular interest, and their deep-seated interests and concerns, I understand, uh, will uh, will be, be will be better off as a profession doing that. We'll come back to the, as I said, to the Oregon uh, laws, and they've been raised specifically, so we will do that. But I just want to hear Bob on the first part of the question that we've just been discussing. Yeah, well, I, I think the double effect is a nonsense, uh, and I think it's it's become quite clear that it's causing. Uh, serious concerns for many doctors, and I think the questioner has made that point. Uh, but I think it, it also is a concern for the community. The community is, is absolutely united on the view that they believe that we should not treat our community uh, worse than we treat our pets. Uh, and and the, the community is, is at a point of saying we believe that it should be possible for, the, for a, uh, an informed person to request death and have help from the doctor who's treating them, uh, who's there not just to uh, keep them alive, but to manage their concerns. And so I, I think uh, the, the Doctrine of Double Effect is simply a, a legal uh, circus around the, the, the problem that we, we have because we haven't enacted sensible legislation. Okay, just, just a whole, hold on everyone. I'm just going to bring in, um, there's a comment that's come in. I'll try and bring these in from time to time. This one's from Kyle Sheldrick. Why is paternalism taboo in all other aspects of medicine, but we deny any role for patient choice in choosing to die on their own terms? Karen, you wanted to come in. You might like to respond to that. Uh, well, paternalism's not taboo, really, when it comes down to it. We just pretend it is. And um, we don't deny any role for the patient to choose. I mean, that, that horrendous example that the questioner gave us of a, a woman who chose to have her treatment withdrawn, which every single patient has the right to choose not to have a treatment, so she wants her trachea out, and um, we know what the result of that is, that she's going to suffocate. And the, the doctor neglected to give her... You know, we have an ancient treatment that will mean that she doesn't f feel that and her family doesn't have to watch her choke to death, and that was withheld from her. And I think her right was to have her, her symptoms treated. Her right was to have her, her treatment withdrawn. It's not her right to say, kill me. I mean, she, that, that's completely different. And where people do have the right to, uh, to end their life when they want, suicide is not illegal. But, but we, what we're asking for is a right um, to kill, that is a right to give doctors, you know, the right to kill, and a right to uh, demand to be killed. And both of those things, we, I, I don't think that we have that right. Okay, um, that's actually a perfect segue, in a way, into the Oregon laws, which were canvassed by the question. And I'll go uh, to Malcolm first on this. The Oregon laws are interesting in that the doctors are at arm's length. The Oregon law is incidentally about to be uh, taken up in California too, so um, another 38 million uh, Americans will be uh, under the same kind of laws, but they actually give doctors the right to opt out of the system completely, and when it comes to their involvement in the system, it is about prescribing, not administering. In fact, they're prohibited from administering. So I just wonder if that makes a difference. Malcolm first. I think that makes a difference. I think it, it, it's intuitively more appealing even to people uh, who oppose the legalisation of euthanasia, to use that single word, um, that physician-assisted suicide be um, legalised. So if you were opposing it, you would say, OK, well, that's better than the, the, the full Monty, as it were, uh, the lethal injection. And that is because at the right at the end point, the patient still has control to pick up the point about paternalism and patient control and patient autonomy. So it is more intuitively appealing um, to legislatures, uh, pro uh, to doctors on the whole, I think, and probably to the population. So the Oregon model, uh, the Washington model, the California model uh, is different, of course, from the European model where both physician-assisted suicide and lethal injection or other lethal means are lawful. 
Um, so, do you think the Australian public would be prepared to accept, given the overwhelming, in terms of opinion polls, um, the overwhelming number of people who want uh, some form of doctor-assisted dying, only according to opinion polls, I hasten to add, do you think they'd be prepared to accept a kind of halfway house, which is what Oregon and California represent? I think, I think they'd be more prepared to accept that um, on, a, on a population basis. Putting that another way, it'd be more likely through the political system, uh, through the state political, through the state uh, parliaments, to get that sort of legislation through than the double whammy. It's just so preposterous. If I write a script, um, I take responsibility for giving that medicine to the patient. A script is a recommendation. I don't. Uh, obviously, a patient has a choice not to take it. But if, if a doctor gives a patient a script, they're saying, "Please take this warfarin," or you know, "This is my recommendation to you." And if a patient comes and says, "I want to die," I don't say, "Well, it's up to you. Here's the script. Take it or don't take it." I mean, it's just. I think that, that that's, if you think double effect is uh, preposterous, then the idea that somehow uh, the doctor's responsibility or that giving someone a script is not an act is equally preposterous. Uh, look, can I just, can I quickly say, um, I couldn't agree more with what you said. What I said was that it would be more likely on an intuitive basis that this halfway measure uh, would be passed by a parliament. But I couldn't agree more with you, Karen, um, I don't see any moral difference whatsoever between the lethal injection and pr providing a prescription. Let's hear from Mark at the end. He's so, Tony, take, your own, take your own words. I mean, so if it's a halfway house, where's full house? Because I think that's the real question in mind. Um, so what, are, what, is, what is the AMA trying to achieve? You asked the question, so I'll, I'll explain what yep. I meant by halfway house. Uh, a full house is a doctor administering the medicine or the lethal dose, as in Canada or the European models. Halfway house is at arm's length. That's what I was thinking, just to clarify. OK, so that would include then the, 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 uh, both the Dutch and the Belgian model, where potentially as existential suffering could be included. So the example of the uh, man with early dementia, which is close to my heart as a geriatrician, was able to convince whatever process they had that it was reasonable for him to take his life, uh, that under the Gurin principles, uh, that it's quite reasonable for children to also uh, receive euthanasia, which is, exists as well. I understand the conditions were for um, uh, terrible skin conditions, but these are the realities of the full house. So that's, your, that's where we're talking about. So my question is, what is it that the AMA is trying to achieve? Uh, I think we've got to actually realise that this is a debate uh, about advice to a federal council uh, in a membership organisation. And we're, if we're interested in anything as an AMA, according to our strategic view, uh, and that is to actually achieve a better health for those in the community, uh, I'm just wondering why this extensive debate uh, about a small piece of legislation around euthanasia is taking dominance over an extensive and important debate about better palliative care and the introduction of good and widespread use of advanced care directives. Uh, reasonable question. Bob, before I bring you in, I'm just going to bring in Georgie because um, you're obviously here as a lawyer and you actually have looked at the various laws and the differences between them. So since the Oregon law was raised by that question, what does it mean for doctors in Oregon and now in California? So the Oregon law has some quite detailed requirements and actually it's, uh, the, some of the requirements are quite similar to the Rights of the Terminally Ill Act that was passed in um, the Northern Territory 20 or so years ago, uh, which of course we all know was... Um, uh, kind of made ineffective by some federal legislation. So the, the interesting I think, thing I think for doctors is that there's quite a few safeguards in the Oregon legislation. Um, no one can be compelled to, as, as we mentioned, end someone's life through a lethal injection. So it certainly doesn't deal with um, active euthanasia, using that terminology. Um, there's so, and no one can be forced to participate. No healthcare providers under any duty to provide um, physician-assisted suicide. So there's those sorts of provisions in here. Which there's is effectively an opt-out clause. Yeah, that's it. Hospitals can't be uh, forced to participate in this um, in this legislation. So there's those sorts of uh, safeguards for those who don't wish to be involved. And for those who do wish to be involved, then there's immunity from prosecution um, and liability. Uh, and and disciplinary action if they act in good faith and without negligence. And Bob, 
So the doctors are safe. What about the patients? Uh, well, okay. let's hear from Bob first. Well, can I, can I comment on the patients? I think from the perspective of the patients, and I'm getting close to that point, uh, closer probably than the rest of the people on the panel. And, and, and my concern, as I think uh, is true for millions of Australians, is that when I get to that point uh, of uh, incurability and inevitability, I don't want to put all my relatives through the pain and suffering that, that uh, uh, will, will come from a, a, an elongated process uh, that is quite unnecessarily elongated. And I, I recognise there's various uh, permutations of, of, of the way that might be terminated. But it, it does seem to me that the Oregon approach is likely to give a lot of people comfort to know that it is possible to have a, a prescription uh, a, a given by the, by the physician that can sit in the locker that you can take at the point you want. And it seems to me it's absolutely ludicrous that we, we prevent that from happening in Australia at the present time. We make the possession of Nembutal uh, a, a, a felony or, or, or a, a crime, uh, and yet that is exactly the sort of reassurance that people want. And for so many people who have that in Oregon, I think it's about uh, two-thirds, they, they won't use it. But it is part of the sense of reaching the end of their lives that they uh, seek and, and would like to benefit from. It is true um, that 33% of the very small number of people who actually take advantage of this law um, end up using the lethal dose. That is true. Uh, but Mark wanted to jump in. So, so two-thirds... Actually, with pro appropriate support and, and sharing of their suffering and anguish, would actually not have even wanted it in the first place. So, so uh, I don't necessarily think that follows according to Bob. Well, I, I think that that's that's debated. Um, so again, we go back to this question of what it is we're trying to achieve as an as an outcome, and um, you know. As as uh, as uh, Levi Miller said in uh, Neil Neil Levi, sorry, from Macquarie University, and I think it's a very important thing. Is this question about is choice a freedom? Choice is never a freedom. Choice is actually a burden. I don't know how many of you have had to choose what mobile phone number you want, what, what ring you want on your mobile phone. It's a pain. And I think that in fact there's a real <laughs> risk. And I, I think we're talking here about concept of going to the Oregon legislation without talking about the elephant in the room. And the elephant is the room is what is our role as a profession? It's all well and good for the public to say, yeah, doctor, you're going to help me die or you're going to kill me. But we're the ones who have to actually carry the psychological burden of that. Now, there are some in the room who probably say, yeah, no worries, I can do that. That's fine. OK, fair enough. But this is a profession we're talking about. We have, we have a capability as a profession. We are in this space all the time. As a geriatrician, I am in this space every day working with people who are diagnosed with dementia, who face all these sorts of difficulties, and we share them together. And I want to be able to deal with those as I can uh, and uh, so share that. as a matter that. of principle, um, would it worry you if some people opted to do that and others such as you opted not to, which is, of course, the right under the California-Oregon laws? My issue here is that, in fact, the question in, in, opt, in, in providing the option, providing the choice, I'm actually applying a value to that life. So if they were to say, I've got dementia and I know that in the next eight years I'm going to become dependent, right? Therefore, there's a cost to the community. Now, if, if I've got choice, so then surely my choice is, is now, now if I choose actually to go on and be a burden in someone else's mind, not my own mind, to the community. Therefore, that is applying, I'm, I'm now applying a burden. If there was never any choice, this is my life. Yes, that's so, so, so therefore, just, just so therefore just, if, if an individual... Very briefly, as yeah. a matter of principle, you would oppose other doctors having that option to prescribe, whereas right. you would obviously opt out. You would object to other doctors having that right. Is that I, correct? I think, yeah, as a profession, as a profession, we have to give some direction in our community to, to these particular principles, okay. and I, my, that would, I would think that would be inappropriate. Okay, now that, that, that actually brings up the, the issue that you raised before as to um, 
as to the AMA's role in this. And so a question has come up on the, uh, on the Twitter feed. I'll just read it out. It's from Corey. Uh, I believe that assisted dying will eventually be legalised, but I do not believe Australia is ready for this discussion. And I don't think the AMA can currently have a unified view on this. Malcolm. Well, if we're not ready for the discussion now, we never will be, because we've been having the discussion for the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, so I'm not quite sure uh, what the commentator's uh, driving at there. I mean, if you think of the history of the debate, the discussion, a number of uh, areas of the debate have really been moved past, I think. And perhaps that's, that's one of the reasons why we're talking here today. We're talking about both the euthanasia question or the assisted dying question but we're also talking about the question of, to put it this way, even if the community passed legislation to allow for it, se the second question is, should doctors be participants in it? And I think they're two discernible um, questions. But we have certainly moved past a number of um, areas of the debate which were very heatedly discussed 20 or more years ago. So, for example, the distinction between actions and omissions. And if you go back to Robert's um, question about pulling the tracheostomy out, was that an action or was that an omission? It's quite possible that a court, if that case was brought to court, would look at that as being an omission or a removal of burdensome treatment and there would be no criminal cost to pay. But I would challenge you to think about that. Where does your intuition lie in relation to that action or omission? What is it? So this action and omission distinction, on which a lot has turned, I think uh, both sides of the debate uh, should concede has been sort of left in the past, and we've now moved on to other okay, areas. Okay, that, that actually, we've got a few people lined up, we've got one person lined up at a microphone, but just before I come to you, sir, just before I come to you, my one person lined up at the microphone, we actually had a, a questioner um, that had a question related to what you just said. Um, I've got it on my list um, as question number five, and it's Dr. Lauren Laura, uh, sorry, Lawler Smith, Dr. Lauren Lawler Smith. Uh, is Dr. Lauren Lawler, there, there we go, we've got a microphone to you quickly, and uh, after that we'll come to you, sir, in the, on the microphone. Thank you. Um, would, you would you mind standing up, uh, Lauren? Um, why, if the AMA has a deliberate policy of neutrality on abortion, which some doctors morally oppose, does the AMA think it appropriate to have a policy opposed to voluntary euthanasia, um, which many doctors morally support? Okay, we'll start with Karen. No, I'm nothing to do with the AMA. I don't know why they feel the need. Is that what the question was? That's an AMA question. Actually, it wasn't the question that I was expecting. I think Lauren must have more than one question, as a matter of fact. Um, so, look, I don't I mean, know why the AMA thinks they need to. Do you want to answer? <laughs> yeah, OK. Look, that's fair enough. Lauren, do you have your other question it says about the logic behind supporting rational choice? I'm sorry about that. What's the logic behind the AMA supporting the rational choice of an informed patient to refuse life-supporting medical treatment or to request the re removal of or turning off of medical equipment, but not supporting the rational choice of an informed patient who requests medical aid in dying? The end point is the same. The patient's wish to achieve relief by choice of death is satisfied. I'll start with uh, Mark, and although he's not in the AMA, he was once, uh, not a, officially the AMA, he was once, so you definitely have opinions on what the AMA should and shouldn't do. Well, I don't think I can quote, I can't speak for the AMA, but let's talk about this issue of, of intent, and I think the law actually indicates that these are completely different things anyway. But I mean, in, in, in a simplistic way, I, I guess the point is that I think as doctors, we're here to assist patients and families to cope with the fears and anxieties of a patient who is dying. That is when death is on the threshold uh, and, and already opened the door. And that's what our key role is, and that's why we're healers. I think also medicine and science has also unfortunately gave, given us the ability to build a fire door at the hall and a portcullis at the dining room hall room and, and, and double locks on the living room and actually a, uh, uh, a double door on the, on the bedroom. 
And so, you know, we, we, in the attempt that hope that death might get bored or walk away. And I, I think that we have, there's, if any of us are in practice, any of those of us who are in practice, and interestingly, a lot of the calls for euthanasia comes from those who aren't in practice, um, uh, or certainly those who are at the interface um, of, of this particular area, would say is completely different taking out an endocrineal tube of a patient with chronic obstructive airways disease in ICU and supporting them while they die. And that's a completely different thing than saying to someone with mild dementia who says, I don't want to live for the rest of for, for the next eight years. Yeah, come on, we'll, uh, we'll arrange so we can actually extinguish your life. Um, Bob? Well, well, I don't think there... I, I think I disagree with, with Mark on that. I'm sure I, you would. Uh, I, I do think <laughs> that for many people, uh, the, the, uh, they can't make the distinction that you've made. And, and I think the law, as I said earlier, is an ass on this. That's it's, why it's a an, profession, Bob. What, we're what? the profession to help. With, that's why we're the profession. I mean, we get paid $200,000 a year to make these sorts of decisions. That's why the community gets it wrong. I see. So 83% uh, of the community has got it dead wrong. Well, uh, yeah, you've and, got to ask and, the question. And, uh, Mark, we, I think, uh, Mark, I think you better let uh, Bob uh, <laughs> waited patiently for you to make your answer, and I think you probably and, should and hear we, him out. We, the professions, know, professionals know better and can make this, this crazy distinction. Uh, to, to my mind, the, the, the problem is that this distinction has been, uh, you say it's the law, the law is made by the community uh, and, and our, our representatives. Uh, the, the community is demanding or, or requesting that we change this. Uh, it's not happening. Uh, and, and something's happening uh, that organisations like the AMA are standing in the way because they think they know better. For God's sake. Uh, the, the problem is clearly that a lot of people get to the point of seriously feeling they want to end their lives. Now, it's true that uh, they may change their minds. It's true that they may be depressed. It's true that there may be a lot of other factors operating. But uh, a, a significant number of people feel that unless they can have that possibility, life is seriously troubling to them. And I don't think all the professionalism and uh, pretense that the, uh, that the medical profession makes it, that it knows better uh, is good enough uh, for the community at large. Uh, Georgie, I'll just bring you in on the, the pure legal question. So effectively it is legal to take someone off um, all forms of treatment and to allow them even in palliative care uh, to starve to death. But it's not legal to hasten their death um, it's not legal to give them medicines which kill them even though they ask for it. Um, so is that, is that as clear cut as that? Um, well, I wouldn't say starve to death and I think probably the uh, doctors would, would probably, um, a lot of doctors would object to that emotional terminology but I'm not a clinician so I won't go there. So um, it's the withdrawal of artificial fluids What happens fluids when fluids. you stop feeding people? I'm not, a, I'm not a clinician, but okay. the, generally I think the general accepted phrase is around withdrawing food and fluids or withdrawing artificial feeding and nutrition. Mm. Um, the law is, I think... So I'm really sorry, but I just actually want to say one thing here because I think many people um, in the community have this Hollywood idea about what it is to die. You know, dying at home means you're in your own bed, beautiful soft pillow, and you close your eyes and turn your head and all your loved ones are around with candles. Really, it is quite a natural death, in inverted commas, whatever that is. If you're 96 years old and you manage to avoid hospital and you, you know, you, your organs slowly shut down, you stop eating and drinking and you slowly die. It's not some... When we feel hunger, it's painful. When someone who's dying stops eating and drinking as their organs um, go quiet, it's not a painful um, state of active desiring for food and drink. It's, in fact, you would dehydrate to death before you would starve to death. It doesn't take very long, and there are natural bodily processes that take over. And it's How long does it take, um, actually, Karen? I mean, is there a, a sort days. of... Is there, is there an you can't go sort? without water for more than a few days. I mean, how long can you go without water? Not very long. It just... 
takes a few days and it's not some terrible, you're lying there like this. I mean, I hear it all the time in the media, people starving and dehydrating to death and, you know, it even makes me feel scared. There is so much fear out there. There is such a lack of good palliative care training and education and we need to start there at least before we start going, oh, let's go in for a clean kill. I mean, it's just really... This can get so emotional and... I'm so sick of TV shows because this makes great TV. You never, ever see any documentary show running you through a family whose family member is in hospital having an excellent palliatively, palliative care-led peaceful death. Never would you see that because it's just boring, isn't it? I mean, you, what you want is terrible stories of suffering and drama, and they do happen. That's that's the shame for us, and we need to take responsibility for that and really pick up our game because the public is really scared, and that's why it's become so emotional and such a big issue, which really, if we had good palliative care, it's not. The euthanasia question is not one question either. It's many things. The situation of somebody with metastatic cancer in the last days of their life in unbearable pain, that is one, well, that's one question. And really, that's the only thing that's go that legislation will be made about. Then there's the next question of whether people with... Uh, Neuro, you know, neurodegenerative diseases, should they be allowed to uh, um, have uh, uh, euthanasia? I mean, that's a completely separate question. The first question, I think, is simple because if there's access to good palliative care and then the, the patient's uh, symptoms can be treated. The second issue of the, you know, any sort of neurodegenerative disease is a completely different issue and I don't think anyone in Australia is yet saying that people you know, with uh, early dementia should be allowed to kill themselves. And the third part of euthanasia is when you just feel that your, um, you, you know, your illness is going to go on for years and you're going to be a burden to your family and you should be able to ask your doctor to kill you. I mean, you know, suicide is a really big issue amongst elderly men and young men. And for some reason... Whenever an old person kills himself now, we go, oh, that's why we should have euthanasia. But if a young person kills himself, it's like we're saying, well, obviously the old person would want to kill themselves because their life's not worth living, is it? I mean, you know, as if they can't be feeling despair, worthlessness, you know, pain, fear, loneliness. I... I my view on this issue has, is not based on religion. I'm atheist. It's not ideological. I am completely far-left progressive and am amazed that the progressives are all pro-euthanasia. <laughs> it is, just comes from my experience of working in a general medical ward for the last 12 years, looking after the, the, the oldest patients, the drug-addicted patients, the dispossessed, the homeless, the most vulnerable people in our community whose lives are extremely painful and who very often feel that life is not worth living and that their life is intolerable and they come for help. And if they have the option of coming and asking for me to kill them, they will. My job is to say, why do you want to die? What can I do to make your life better or bearable in some way? Malcolm, uh, on the principle that you never interrupt a brilliant monologue, I didn't interrupt Karen uh, for a moment, but she did raise a whole bunch of issues. But let me take you right back to the question, uh, which was about whether there's a, uh, some sort of... Um, disconnect uh, between the AMA's position or the general position that you can take people off uh, medical care and hasten their death or and allow them to go to their death, um, take them off food and water, uh, but you can't give them an easier, quicker option. Well, I think, uh, and I'm sure that Georgie can uh, supplement this uh, or give a better account than I can, but the law historically recognises intention, as we've already discussed before. And so if you intend someone's death, then, as Georgie pointed out, that's tantamount to murder. But the law also recognises uh, the fact that omissions can lead to death 
and the law is peppered with uh, indications of where omissions to do all sorts of things uh, can be met with criminal or other aspects of, of legal sanction. So again, we get back to this um, acts and omissions distinction. So if you... In, uh, the distinction, and I think a lot of doctors uh, take this to be the case, if you intend to cause death, that's unacceptable. It's um, unacceptable professionally, medically, and so on. But if you intend to remove burdensome treatment, that's okay, because if you didn't, you would, in effect, be it would be tantamount to assault by continuing the treatment. So the law has historically recognised um, that distinction, but it's also recognised that omissions can cause all sorts of trouble and get people into all sorts of trouble. So I would conclude from that that we're at a, at a time where we can look, uh, where we should look at the law and say, well, acts can be culpable, omissions can be culpable, depending on the circumstances. And the crucial fundamental issue is not whether you're withdrawing burdensome treatment or killing someone, is just burdensomeness per se. And if you are in a position where you don't, where you're not, there's no treatment to remove, um, then you're still, you still can be in a burdensome situation where the only option to help you if you want to end your life would be active assistance. Okay, I'm, what I'm going to do is go down to, we've got a few people lined up to ask questions now, which is good. None on those microphones on either side, I might add. Um, go ahead, sir, your question. Can you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Chung Si Yong, I'm a psychiatrist and uh, I've been, a, like Mark, a previous AMA office bearer. But I just, uh, I wanted to sort of uh, ask a question to the panel, I think, which might answer one of Mark's questions about why we're here and why is the AMA interested. And I think uh, my question is about you know, the, whether you think if the role of a doctor in relation to their patient changes because of some kind of legal ability for doctors in some circumstances to kill their patients or to help the patients die, whether that, what do they think, will, how that will affect the way in which all of us, whether we take part in this or not, are going to be seen by, by our patients. And I say this because I'm one of the doctors who every day I'm asked, I see people who are asking to die or have tried to die for all sorts of reasons, mostly non, not to do with an, a medical illness of some kind. Um, a lot of it's to do with life circumstances. And what I certainly know is that most of those people might be suicidal at one time or another, but they're not suicidal all the time. It depends on what else is going on in life and what other things they have. So how am I, who am I to say, when they come to see me at a certain time, whether things might be different for them the next day or in six months' time or a year's time. So I, I feel this is really difficult. Okay. Um, I'll, draw, I'll draw you to your question because I, I think yeah. we've got the gist of it now. So, so the question is really, where, if this were to come in, how do you think the view of uh, the public and patients in general would see it with the doctor? The doctor at the moment is a, is a position of healer. Um, it's quite clear when I see patients that I'm there to try and help them with their life and to keep them alive and to help them with their illness. Now, if I also have the power and I okay, misuse that power... I'm going to have to yeah. take the last part of your yeah. question as a comment. You, you, you finish your question, yeah. I think, and then you're making a point, yeah. which okay. I guess some people on the panel... I know Mark, for example, has a strong opinion on this. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll go to the panel and, and start getting... Um, their views. Mark, go ahead. Do you want me to so I think there's two, two questions that was asked. The answer to the first question is yes. I think that if as the AMA, as if as the profession, we turn around and say it is okay for doctors to kill their patients, it will fundamentally change our relationship as a profession with our community. So that's the answer to the first one. The second question is about adaptation. And I, I urge you all to go to a YouTube and look at BJ Miller, who's a palliative care physician uh, in, at UCLA. Um, and he talks about suffering and adaptation after he was uh, struck, uh, he was electrocuted and lost his arm and both legs and went on to be a doctor and a physician uh, and a palliative care physician. Because adaptation is a huge part of this, uh, cooling off periods, etc., etc., are all built in to the Netherlands and Belgian legislation, I agree with that. But the fundamental question that drives your popularity polls in the community are not about things that can be cooled off, 
but are about good management of my mum dying in the next six months. And no legislation is going to change that, but good palliative care, understanding advanced care directives will. But if we change the legislation, we fundamentally change our relationship with the community. So we should up palliative care and not change our particular policy. I understand the question. I understand fully that you are in a situation of being a healer and you're concerned that, you, that, that we will change the label of the profession to being uh, something different. That hasn't happened in Oregon uh, and it, it, it needn't happen if, in fact, you adopt the, the, the position that Rod Syme adopts, that, that a, uh, a, physi a, a physician is there to help alleviate the suffering of his patients. Often, or infrequently, that suffering can only be alleviated by death. If It seems to me that is a perfectly rational part of being a doctor, to alleviate the suffering of uh, people who have been through a series of, uh, of, of uh, safeguards and, and we haven't talked about safeguards at all, but, but it does seem to me that there are a whole range of safeguards that are in place uh, in, uh, in, in a number of jurisdictions, uh, and in Oregon they've been there for 12 years. Uh, so uh, I, I hear what you're saying, but I think that there, there is a, a concern uh, in the community that, the, that there has been a, a complete takeoff of... Uh, healing uh, to the to the detriment of suffering. Um, uh, now, Karen wants to get in, but I just, if you don't mind, just want to ask Georgie put a put your patient's hat on for a moment. Um, if if you feel comfortable in doing that, well, eventually <laughs> you will. If you're not at the moment, be a patient. At some point, you'll be a patient. Um, uh, do you think that would change your relationship with your doctor? Uh, if you knew they had this ability? It's a personal question. Yeah, it is a personal question, and I promised myself and others that I wouldn't uh, give a personal opinion, so I won't. But okay. what it does raise, um, Chung Su's question raises a really interesting question, I think, as a lawyer, about the role of law in society and whether law reflects society or whether law... Um, sort of imposes itself and imposes moral positions on society? I don't know the answer to that question, but I think in relation to the question about... Um, you were talking about the difference between withdrawing and withholding, and there's a oh, whole... Oh, sorry, I meant to come No, back no, to that's it, yeah. all right. There's a whole heap of... Malcolm will know it well, no doubt, the philosophical discussion around acts and omissions and whether they're philosophically um, equivalent. But I guess the role of the law is to draw a line where society says that this is acceptable or not. And I think that's what they've done in relation to with the laws done in relation to withholding and withdrawing treatment said this is the this is acceptable, but going further than that is unacceptable. And so I guess it, it just has a role in working out a framework within a broad sort of spectrum of behaviour. All right, Karen wants to come in. Karen, I'm just going to uh, read a comment that's come in from uh, the floor again, and then I'll come back to the floor for actual questions. Uh, this is from uh, Dr John P. Woodall, as a country doctor, I can confirm a high proportion of doctors do not have the confidence and or competence to adequately relieve suffering, including the imperative of adequate analgesia. analgesia. It is not the fundamental cause of and motivation for efforts supporting euthanasia, the lack of understanding the fundamentals of care at the end of life is not the fundamental cause of and motivation for efforts supporting euthanasia, the lack of understanding the fundamentals of care at the end of life, to read that with a proper emphasis. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that's absolutely true. I think people are really scared. And, you know, I just want to say one thing about 80-whatever percent of the population of Australia allegedly support euthanasia. That what 83% uh, support is an answer to a question in a survey saying that if you are in unbearable pain in a terminal phase of a terminal illness, do you think uh, physicians should be able to assist you to die? And the answer is yes. I mean, you can you can manipulate the question and get the answer. I mean, probably I would say yes to that, but it's but you know that but that that doesn't exist. I mean, there's always going to be an increasing dose of pain relieving medication you can give so it's sort of everyone saying over and over oh the entire population of Australia agrees with euthanasia is just complete rubbish 
to what I, I think that it's a really big risk what you're saying, and what we're talking about is um, drafting legislation that determines which lives are and which lives aren't worth living. So when all of your patients come to you and say, I want to die, you, you do your best to help them live their life. All of a sudden we're going to be saying, like, how do we triage them into suicide and, you know, this, these people should, these people can commit suicide and these people can't. I mean, we're, we're going to, as, you know, talk about paternalism, we're going to decide together, the lawyers and the doctors, which life is worth living and which life isn't worth living. And I just think, you know, where do we draw the line? It's going to be arbitrary and it's, uh, it's not a line, it's a cliff. Okay. Uh, Malcolm? I'll bring you in and I'll, once again I'll bring you in with a comment from the floor because it's again relevant to the issue of uh, the role of doctors. Uh, legalise, this is from RC, legalise assisted dying if you wish, do not involve the medical profession, you do not need a doctor to die, task substituted to a defined identifiable other, in inverted commas. Yes. Yes, so I suppose it would be some government department which would distribute Nemutal to people who warrant it. You could privatise it. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> Bring on the death nurse. There's a couple of comments that I, that I can make there. Um, quite a number of years ago there, were, there was a sort of a, a small flurry of articles in the literature along this line uh, which suggested that there ought to be a sort of a subspecialty, not necessarily composed of doctors, but doctors could um, become part of it and they would be known as thanatologists. Um, the second comment, of course, is that um, generally speaking, uh, doctors, the tasks that doctors do, uh, they are being relieved of some of them and some doctors feel threatened um, by that, nurse practitioners, etc., etc. So uh, the comment, I think, uh, is not a, not a flippant one. Um, how you would go about that, I'm not sure. Um, my view is that that wouldn't run. One of the reasons for that is that some people are capable of committing suicide. Let's assume that the legislation is in place. Some people are capable of committing suicide, so they might go and commit suicide if they view their life as no longer worth living. Um, but not everybody is capable. And so there is a very, there's a small proportion of people under any legislation who will need some kind of um, assistance. And can I just um, add one brief comment there, taking up uh, Karen's last comment about uh, the value of life? Because I disagree very strongly with the idea that we can, um, you know, tri the, the whole concept of triaging patients, your life is worth living, your life is not worth living. It's not up to the doctors to make a decision about whose life is worth living. Patients who ask for assistance to die, everything else being equal, they're the ones who've made the decision about whether their life is worth living. And some people come to that decision, well, my life, to me, is no longer worth living. Yeah, like lots of 18-year-old males, for example. I mean, you know... <laughs> well, it's surely not beyond us to discern between certain categories of cases, such as 18-year-old males um, who, have, who may have some kind of mental disorder uh, and elderly or even not elderly people uh, with chronic illness, severe illness, um, and the usual end-of-life situations that we're really talking about. So let's go back to patient autonomy then. Yes. Because ultimately, if this is about patient autonomy and choice, We've just accepted that an 18-year-old doesn't have that autonomy or choice because doctors will say, oh, no, I think you're feeling a bit depressed and we can make you better. But somehow it's OK for an 80-year-old who has some mild dementia and multiple chronic diseases who says that to, to just ignore the fact that we would say to them, no, I think actually we can make you a whole lot better because, in fact, if we actually got you into some supported care and there was an environment that you enjoyed, you had purposeful activity that was relevant to you in your con current cognitive condition and you could enjoy life, which you can, uh, oh, yeah, we won't do that because you can have suicide. That's fine. So, so That's we're not allowing autonomy. So we don't allow autonomy because even under the Belgian and Netherlands legislation, you need two doctors and somebody else to say whether or not you can or can't. Sadly, it's all assessed retrospectively. 
uh, so it's not done in advance. Okay, let's uh, just bring in. You, you mentioned once again the the legal issue comes up, and I'll bring Georgie back in on that score. What safeguards are there? against someone going along to a doctor in Oregon and in the future in California and just saying, I want to die, um, I'm just so unhappy with my life, um, will you agree to allow me to die and give me the medicine? So the legislation has a few requirements. You have to um, get a second opinion. Interestingly, um, the Oregon legislation doesn't have a requirement of a psychiatric or psychological assessment, whereas the uh, Northern Territory legislation does. Um, Do you- well, yeah. I mean, it's still on the it's still on the books. It's just made ineffective by the legislation. So it's still it still exists. Um, Is it the case that in Oregon, um, if one of the two doctors, independent of each other, decide the person has an underlying psychological condition, they call in a psychiatrist? That, that's it. So that's okay. where it comes in in the Oregon legislation. But they have to the attending physician has to. Um, come to a view that they may be suffering from depression, whereas the Northern Territory legislation made the psychiatric assessment mandatory. Um, and there's other things that have to be an Oregon resident, so we can't have people coming from other jurisdictions to take advantage of the legislation. Um, they have to fit the criteria of terminal disease. They have to give informed consent. Another interesting difference is that there's no specific mention in the Oregon legislation of the requirement to advise about palliative care, whereas that's in some of the other legislation. Someone, uh, incidentally, uh, asked a very simple question uh, on, the, on the feed here. It was, what is a terminal illness? Uh, Bob. Is it obviously something that would be absolutely critical? You have to define it under law, what it is. In fact, under the Oregon, California laws, you have to have doctors define that you are within six months of death. I, I don't know that I'm the right person to answer that. I haven't, haven't had to do that for a long, long time. But uh, I think it is uh, clearly it, it's part of the medical sphere to attempt to uh, develop a prognosis, and doctors give prognoses all the time. Um, clearly, somebody who's got terminal uh, cancer disseminated through many organs and, and is deteriorating and so on, uh, and, and has not responded to chemotherapy and radiotherapy, uh, that may be an, an example. There are plenty of other examples, and I'd, I'd sooner to leave it to the more active clinicians. Yeah, we're, to... we're, we're not bad when it comes to advanced cancer in prognosticating, but we're pretty hopeless when it comes to everything else, and certainly we couldn't bring it down to months. And interestingly, in Oregon, uh, something like only, I think, 15 or 20 per cent of psychiatrists, when asked, said they could confidently exclude a mental illness in patients uh, requesting assisted suicide. And so that you know, it's not like these things are clear cut at all. I mean, only 20 per cent said that they would be able to confidently exclude. So I don't know if anyone saw the uh, documentary, I think it was on Dateline, is that the SBS documentary last year uh, about a journalist from Australia going to Belgium and uh, went through a few patients' cases of uh, where they requested euthanasia. One woman in particular in her 80s living in a low-level care facility, perfectly sound mind and body, requested to die. Her GP saw her, got another GP to see her. They both agreed she should die um, and so gave her the medicine she drank it died on camera most shocking thing I've ever seen and I've had you know I've seen hundreds of patients die and um, she uh, turns out her daughter was run over three months prior and you know she was in a terrible terrible grief state but uh, the the doctor supported that you know that grief state was uh, a reason to die and that case was the first case in Belgium ever to be investigated so obviously they're checks and balances are, you know, good, because everyone says they are, and obviously Belgium doctors are perfect. So can we go back to... Okay, I'm going to, so speaking of perfect doctors, we've got a very perfectly polite doctors all lined up at the microphone here, so I'm going to bring them in. Uh, so I've been, people have been jumping the queue, um, like asylum seekers or something, um, by getting on the Twitter feed. <laughs> Tony knows who I am. Um, Richard Kidd, I'm a GP and one of my other hats in life has been doing a lot of palliative care in the community, um, in people's own homes, hospices, um, aged care facilities. 
probably palliated thousands of people, so a brief comment about this. And just in the last couple of months, um, 20, uh, 18 in nursing homes and two in their own homes. Uh, the, the point about this is that on this palliative journey, which has sometimes been years, existential crises have been one of the things that I've um, been privileged to help people work through. And many people who have, at the beginning of their journey, said that they want to die, they want to be killed. When that's been explored, there has been um, a, a number of issues that when they have been explored and resolved, the person has then approached their death with peace that they didn't have at the beginning. They were tormented when they first had the diagnosis and had all sorts of uh, unresolved issues. So the, the, my first comment is just that a good palliative process actually allows many, many people to resolve their existential crises and repair broken relationships with the, the people they love. Mm -hmm. um, the, the second point is that a lot of the people that I've experienced that have asked that question early in the piece, it's come out of fear, fear of what the dying process will involve. Fear and of pain as well? Richard? Yes, fear of pain, fear of loss of dignity, um, pooing in their bed, you know, those sorts of things. And yet, a number, of, many of those have ended up being palliated at home with their family, with um, domiciliary nursing services coming in, and they have had a really good death. And the family have been absolutely um, pleased that they have been able to be part of that process with their, with their loved ones. So that's the comment. The, the question, it's kind of been partly answered already, goes to um, what it will be the unintended harm um, of opening the door on euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. And I'd just add there that when you're talking about numbers, 85% of Australians actually want to die in their own, own home, not be killed in their own homes, but die in their own homes. And good palliative care is what we really need. But okay. my question is unintended harm, if you could please explore that. Yeah, Bob, we'll start with you. Well, the, the unintended harm is clearly that uh, sometimes we'll get it wrong. Uh, and and uh, I, I know that others on the panel will say the unintended harm is that we're going to embark on a slippery slope and uh, uh, expose everybody to the possibility of uh, an unintended death. Uh, now, the, the, the point about this is that that hasn't been the experience uh, in the countries that have legislated in this way. Uh, it seems to me that we, we're, we keep on throwing up these, these possibilities, and I, I, I totally agree with you that we need to invest heavily in advanced care planning and in good palliative care. That's absolutely central to the, to the, to the last years of life. But uh, there's a lot of people in the palliative care community, including uh, my colleague Ian Maddox, who... who uh, uh, who, who participated in the round table that I chaired on this subject, uh, who, who has said that the palliative care people have seen this as a, an insult to their capacity. Uh, he, he adopts the view that uh, euthanasia and, and assisted suicide should be decriminalised. Uh, and th oh, the he's point in the minority, is, actually... Well, he may well be in a minority. Uh, I don't know, and I'm eagerly looking forward to seeing where the AMA uh, as a body comes out. My understanding was that recently it's been about 50-50 uh, the, uh, across, the, across the profession in favour. Uh, so the, 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 and and I, I want to add that I think the role that AMA plays in this is absolutely crucial. I do hope that the AMA will take a more neutral stance than it's done in the past and, and that it will enable the community uh, and to, to move ahead and work out the, the, the safeguards that we know are working in many countries already and, and uh, as I say, we've, we've now got 12 years of experience in Oregon. Let me uh, bring in Mark and Mark, I'll bring you in, um, I guess, with a bit of a reminder of the, one of the points that's actually in the current AMA position statement. There are some instances where satisfactory relief of suffering cannot be achieved. This is in relation to palliative care. Um, I suppose 
the argument often does revolve around those extreme cases, uh, because in those extreme cases, you, you get families, as we've seen, you saw on Late Line the other night, uh, Shane Higson, whose mother died over 15 days in an extremely painful way in palliative care. Uh, those families often become advocates for a change to the law. And I think those, uh, num those examples are very distressing and, and we have examples in medicine where we have incredible cures which are also fantastic um, and then we have these very, very complex issues where there is, cons there, there is the small number of people. Now, the issue uh, is that, first of all, I think each of those cases is very difficult to understand in a media sense. So I've got no, no knowledge of the true environment in which that occurred. I've got no, no context uh, as to the length or the issues that were being addressed with the family during that time. And I have no idea also about what decisions were made along the pathway to that death that might have actually been a more sensible decision earlier if we had proper palliative care or proper decision making put in place. So I don't think we can draw and draw conclusions from single cases. What we can know, though know, is that um, the Oregon legislation really only relates to a less than 1%. So is that a significant number, as Bob puts it? Well, not on a statistical basis. It's not, not if we take p-values as being relevant. Um, and then what is the number needed to harm or the potential risk in order to change the, the position that we have as a profession? And I would argue the risks far outweigh the, uh, the benefit, not because the slippery slope, because the slippery slope is an interesting argument. If you ask, uh, it, it's slippery in that once you step across or step over the cliff, as Karen describes, you can actually just keep falling but you don't actually have a slippery slope. What happens is that the, the people who, who, who ask for, for changes to legislation just grow. So your halfway house, as you put it, is what everybody says, oh, well, it's only, there's never any slippery slope, but that's because it is only a halfway house. So if we're going to go to the full house, then there's a slippery slope. So I think the, argue, the slippery slope argument is clever language. Um, and I agree that, that it, it's about legislation change. So I think that the number needed to treat is not justifiable to the risks that are associated with this. So okay, Tony, um, Tony, yes, I will bring you in, and I'll bring you in just to, to off the back of it because we've got someone who made a relevant comment here. It's from John Smith. I don't know if this is true or not, but it's come from the audience. Uh, overall suicide rates in Oregon among adults rose approximately 50%, 41% higher than the national average between 2000 and 2010. Uh, the legalisation of assisted suicide in 1997 has undoubtedly normalised suicide to an extent. How can the medical profession countenance normalising suicide? Uh, so that's an added uh, issue alongside the <coughs> Oregon issues, which no doubt you're about to discuss. Well, I, I mean, I think uh, language and the difficulties with language come in here. Many of you will, will uh, recall a famous... Uh, quote from uh, Wittgenstein who said we can be bewitched by language and when you use the, the bald word suicide what do we think of? We think of the 18 year old boy committing suicide, we think of someone throwing themselves off the gap in Sydney etc etc and we have an immediate association um, with mental disorder. No one's going to pretend that the vast proportion of suicides that occur uh, in all our countries are related to mental disorder. Rodney Syme, amongst others, has recommended that we stop using the word suicide and we use, as we are in this uh, session, use the phrase assisted dying because suicide brings up these connotations uh, over which there's a very strong consensus. So uh, I'm not sure about the figures uh, that, that are quoted there from Oregon. I can't make a comment on that. Yeah, uh, and more broadly, the, the issue that we were discussing earlier. Uh, you mean the, the, the distinction between physician-assisted suicide and voluntary euthanasia, as in the case of uh, the lethal injection? Mm. Um, well, uh, what we were discussing earlier was the fact that uh, if legislation uh, goes through in any jurisdiction in Australia, like Oregon and the other US states that have legislated, it's more likely to go through on a sort of pragmatic political basis if it's 
similar to that model because we have, we all, I think, have an in intuition that it's a little bit more serious, and some would say a whole lot more serious, to give someone a lethal injection compared with giving them, giving them a prescription. And we, we talked about this earlier in the session where I agreed with Karen that I don't see any moral distinction uh, between those two um, actions um, at all. But on a purely pragmatic basis, it is likely I, I forgot that that will for a happen. Moment there, but of course, the question that we were addressing before we digress a little bit was about whether palliative care, in fact, is the answer and whether it can solve all problems. Well, um, as we've heard, uh, there are some palliative care physicians who concede uh, readily that palliative care can't help everybody. Um, Bob Dent, the first person who availed himself of the uh, Northern Territory legislation back in the mid-1990s, was offered palliative care, had some palliative care, and decided competently that that was not for him. And it goes to what Mark was talking about before, where he said, well, we can kill the patient or we can offer them treatment and support and so on. And I don't see, I think the problem here is that palliative care and assisted dying are seen as alternatives. I think that's a crucial conceptual and practical mistake. If you look at Belgium, you can see in practice the compatibility of the two um, concepts and the two areas, where assisted dying in a very small number of uh, proportion of cases is part of the palliative care system uh, in Belgium. I'll just quickly go to uh, some more questions from the floor. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Yeah, my name's Dr. Sean Rudd. I'm a uh, general practitioner in a nice little place called Harvey Bay in Queensland, which is known as the place where there are the newlyweds and the nearly deads. And the reason for that is it's, it's, it's also Australia's uh, nursing home, basically. Or, there, would you yeah, no. some <laughs> That's right. You would never get a, another partner because there are no 40-year-olds there. So. The, the, it's, it's true. <laughs> All right, <laughs> a, little, that's a, a little Harvey Bay joke between the two of us. We'll move on. Um, just to move things on to a slightly different place, and the reason I, I said that when Harvey Bay was that we have seven nursing homes within a few kilometers, square kilometres, and uh, I'm lucky enough to go around those nursing homes. And uh, the thing that I struggle with on a daily basis when I'm in any nursing home is the patients who can't say anything, the patients who are lying in the bed, who, as Richard said, are pooing and peeing themselves, the patients who are uh, unable to communicate, the patients who look to me like they're in, you know, inside that head they are suffering. But I don't know the answer to that question. So like most things in life, in life, I always like to get some help from someone. So I'd like the panel to help me in some way work out, am I just being weak by not he helping those people, by not doing something active to, to stop them dying? Or, doing inactive things like, you know, it sounds a bit crude, but putting food within reach and, and seeing if they can reach it. But, you know, it, it's really difficult to see those people and, 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 I, and I, I feel a bit weak when I walk away and just leave them lying there. So I'm interested to know what the panel thinks about that group of, of uh, people. Well, we'll start with Karen on that. Uh, I think, I think it's you. really difficult. Uh, look, I think that... The way that we treat the our you know elderly and disabled citizens is pretty poor. I mean, nursing homes are on the whole. There's some really great ones, but they're on the whole purpose designed to accelerate neurodegenerative decline. Um, and uh, I think that when we look at people who have stopped talking or I presume you mean stopped, accidentally designed in that manner. Well, I'm not sure. They're based on hospitals and they're certainly not places that... Are. Look, there was a parliamentary inquiry about a year ago or something in... I don't know if it was in Victoria or a nationwide into uh, um, young people, young disabled people who were being forced to live in aged care facilities because there was no alternative. And the newspapers were full with of uh, stories 
full of outrage, you know, people saying, my my daughter, uh, she's 50 years old and she has to live in these places with all these old people and she can't decide when she goes to the toilet, she can't decide when she goes outside, she never goes outside, no one visits her, she, she's not allowed to choose what she has to eat, it's outrageous and everyone said, we need to do something about this and improve the lot of these people. But it was like this enormous blind spot. I mean, what, why is that okay when you turn 65? I mean... It's, it was just crazy. I, 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 I don't know what to say. E- each of those scenarios that you describe, they're all individuals and they all have different stories and different, you know, different family situations. And in the hospital, I, you know, people from nursing homes, some with very ad- advanced dementia, come to the hospital for treatment of pneumonia and sometimes they, they come because their family really values the, them, even though they seem that they can't communicate and some, so we would treat that patient because that patient has a place in society and a, a life that is considered valuable by people around them. Some people come in and they've got an advanced directive that says they don't want to come to hospital. So we, you know, if the, we dutifully uh, look at everything that's happening and probably they'll go back to the nursing home with comfort measures. I mean, I don't think... Uh, as a GP going into a nursing home, you, you, you look at those patients or those those residents, those people, and you're, you're, you think they're suffering. I mean, we, we don't know. How, how do you know? Quickly go back to our question. Sorry to interrupt you, Karen. Quickly go back to our question. Just go to the microphone again, if you wouldn't mind. Um, are you, just to get to the nub of your question, are you, are you wondering whether it would be more humane to... Um, to hasten the death of some of these people? Well, I think it goes back to what you would feel yourself, your own values, and, uh, and my parents are both dead now, but, I mean, they clearly stated to me that, the, that no way would, they be, would, was I, would I allow them to be in that situation. And I think there's no way that I want to be in that situation, and I think that that's an important view, but, however, I'm still too weak to do anything about it, and... and that's why I'm wanting help for people okay. to... to right, let's go to Does Mark that make sense? Because, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, can, can I um, try and answer some of this? Because I, as a geriatrician, obviously, I mean, this is commonplace. Um, I think it's important to remember that dementia very rarely kills any... People very rarely die because of their dementia. They die of a complication as a result of neurodegeneration. So they die of a swallowing problem and pneumonia, etc. So the first thing I think is, is important to make sure that when you've got a patient of this sort, that there is some clear advanced care plan and the family understand and are clear with you uh, about what's going to happen. Because remember, the only people who, who really are suffering here are potentially uh, the, uh, the, the family, because they're the ones who will live with the grief if it hasn't been well managed. And it's about the management of that. So... Can you judge whether the person is suffering or not? Well, I think we can. There are very good pain, uh, non-verbal pain measures now. There's the AB pain score, um, and you can ask nursing staff about grimacing and other things when there's movement. And, you know, the fact that we as a community value or we, we provide a value for people who are living and we support that, I think that's very important, and this is the very reason why I don't think we can afford to step across the precipice. Having said that, the population with dementia is very interesting. Um, and I put up a hypothetical quite recently in my hospital where we had a lady who had a dementia, profound dementia, but she was very happy in her dementia-specific nursing home managing and caring for the therapy dolls, and she had acquired a relationship with another man with dementia, and they sat basically hand-in-hand folding towels, and that was a life. Now, the question is that the family had said, well, if I didn't want mum ever to live, if uh, or she had said before, eight years previously, that, well, I didn't want to live if I couldn't recognise family. So we come back to this very, very complex question, which uh, I've put to people like Julian Savalescu. So when is a body, uh, when, when, how do we define suffering? And I don't think we know. So I think the easy end is physical deterioration and then you're very close to death because in dementia that death will occur. But we do, shouldn't be treating the pneumonia. We shouldn't be treating um, uh, a, uh, a stroke event because these are the causes of death in dementia in the terminal phases. 
Uh, Mark, you're, you're obviously quite right in saying, as you said earlier, that uh, with cases like this, uh, the law changes, particularly if you like the halfway house ones, um, as you put it, as I put it, I guess, and you obviously jumped on. Um, those, they would have no effect at all um, on cases like this, would they? That seems to be the main point. And these would be the largest body of people ending, uh, going into end-of-life phase. Yeah, I think that's the, the, the thing that concerns me. Um, you know, we're having all this debate uh, as a profession about a very small group of people, but it's the it's GPs who have to actually... One, if this legislation was passed in Belgium and in, in Netherlands, it's the GPs who get asked all the questions, and yet it doesn't help you with the very population you need most of the help with. And so that's why I think our focus, if we take a public health measure, and Bob's a public health physician, the biggest bang for our buck if we're going to invest any time and energy as a profession is getting palliative care right, not worrying about what's happening in this yeah, particular end. Let me bring in Georgie here briefly, and I'm not sure if your study has gone that deep, but uh, do any of these particular sets of laws in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in Switzerland, uh, maybe in Canada, certainly not in the other places, do they deal with this issue? Um, of, of vulnerable people? Well, yeah. I think that the, some of the legislation does um, allow non un, involuntary euthanasia I think I have I have to confess I didn't go into the detail and I'm sure the others on the panel will know this but um, so there are some jurisdictions that do but certainly the um, you know Oregon and Canada are all about um, competent adults requesting making a request yeah yep. um, so Bob what do you think about this um, does it change your position at all uh, does it make you think or do you think that there just needs to be a sort of segments of, of the uh, of the unwell community who are treated differently I don't think this debate about euthanasia bears closely on the question because I, I think that, that is a, a bigger and broader question. I do think that uh, a, lot of, a lot of the debate, and I'm sure Mark would agree with this, has been generated because people are concerned about what is happening in our nursing homes and, and are concerned about the fact that and, and I'm concerned. I don't, I don't want to die in a nursing home. I would like to have the possibility of a parcel of Nembutal uh, available if, in fact, I get to the point of recognising for sure that I'm, I'm developing Alzheimer's. Uh, and, and I would have no hesitation in, in using it at that point. Now, uh, it seems to me that, that that's... The, the point that we should be rec respecting autonomy. Mark, Mark laughed at autonomy. I think, I think we, we are autonomous creatures. We make decisions about our everyday life every, every moment. And uh, I think we have to respect the concerns that a lot of people have about what uh, precisely the question's been asked. But uh, there's no way we could have physician-assisted suicide uh, quietly dealing with the problem. Uh, but I do think uh, that the, the possibility of reassuring the community that they have a degree of autonomy over the future. Now, uh, I think Marshall Perron, who was, was responsible for the, uh, the Northern Territory legislation, who was part of our round table, uh, put it rather nicely. He said... Uh, the law currently says to us, uh, if you get towards uh, the end of your life and the existential situation is impossible, you can go out and commit suicide, that's all right, we don't want you to, uh, but it is, uh, it, you're allowed to shoot yourself or, or hang yourself from the ceiling fan, but uh, wouldn't it be better if you could, when you reached that point, know that you could have that terminal event with your family uh, and the loved ones and the tears and so on around you uh, and die with dignity rather than uh, go and shoot yourself. I'm going to uh, bring in the next questioner because um, we've got a few would like to try and get to all of them. Thank you very much. Would you? Yes, you can I get I think that. I'm like an asylum seeker. I, I didn't put the name of my question. This, this um, meeting has been... Doctors associated with assisted suicide and euthanasia, you seem to be thinking you're working by yourselves. Because I've worked in palliative care for 20 years, and never has it been just the doctor who's the one to bring peace, whether you call it 
existent or pastoral care. They are very important. So you're talking about people as if they're dogs or your pet cat or your pet horse. You're not thinking of anything more than, this, than the body. And you're thinking about your family? Sure. But there's much more to it, to the person. And I'm just wondering why we're just so stuck in the AMA. I'm a member of AMA and I appreciate it. But when you're talking about, about um, the dying, you've got to think more than the person, the patient. It's the family and it's their inner spirit. And I'm just wondering why we're just stuck there. You're not talking about the person who with pastoral care, help from other people, can really get through the depression, Bob. I know, that, and I've met um, Professor Maddox. He was in Korea when I was there. And we didn't have a round, a round tables discussion, but I was introducing him to one of the other universities to get palliative care going. So my question is, can we not increase the talk? Apart from doctors, doctors only, it's doctors and staff, nurses, and, palliative, and um, pastoral care. Mm. And patients. And the patients, that's the yeah, prime, okay. prime one. Let's, uh, let's hear from Malcolm first. Um, I'll be, I'll be very brief. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more, um, and I, I would imagine everyone would agree with you, but I don't think that um, makes or helps or demonstrates any kind of moral distinction between active assistance to die on the one hand and on the other hand withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment which is one of the sort of the fundamental principles that we have as I said earlier in the past stumbled over and perhaps not really moved forward with so I couldn't agree more with you but I don't think it um, helps the actual um, debate I around that distinction. I actually think that that's, that's exactly the crux of the matter, what you've just brought up, because a good functioning palliative care team is composed of many, many different clinical specialties. Doctors, nurses, psychologists, social workers, grief counsellors, etc., and it involves the entire family. And what we are proposing here is that instead of that, a doctor can give a script to a patient and they can go home alone or to their perfect family that always seems to be described as existing because everyone's family is always perfect in the media, loving, supportive, especially if the person's dead so you can't actually ask them. But that, I think that's exactly the point, that we're replacing that that whole team of individuals, not just the doctor, because really, on my ward, the most important person is the social worker by far. The drugs are pretty useless. But we're going to replace that with, with a script for whatever. Okay, um, I think Bob should get a chance to respond since you were, um, uh, part of the question was directed to you. Well, yeah, uh, the reason I think we're having this debate here is because this is the AMA and the AMA has taken a very strong line on this and has probably been highly influential uh, in the, uh, the fact that we've had 51 attempts to uh, enact legislation in Australia uh, and none of them have succeeded except the, the, the one that uh, Marshal Perron uh, initiated in, in the Northern Territory. So, uh, look, I, I totally agree ab about what's been said about uh, palliative care and about whole, whole person care and multi-people multi involved. What has happened, uh, and the reason why I regard this as a very important uh, venue, is that I do think that the, the medical profession through its uh, AMA has been highly influential. And it's interesting that uh, what has happened in Canada, and we haven't talked about that, but, but uh, Canada is moving now to uh, legislate, uh, and, and the lawyers have helped to make, or the judges have helped to make this happen. Well, in fact, you're right. It was a Supreme Court decision based on a test case, and they resolved that a person who, uh, I think it was with a, a serious debilitating illness, in fact, uh, George, you'll be able to tell me the details, um, that it was too cruel to stop them having the opportunity to end their lives. That was essentially the nub of the decision. And, and, and the, the bottom line is that uh, 
Assisted suicide will become legal in Canada if it hasn't come, become legal already. I think it's in within June. In June. Uh, the, the point about that I want to make is that the Canadians really acted, the Canadian Medical Association has acted with extraordinary responsibility on this and has put out a, a magnificent document that uh, is guidance for doctors uh, and, and uh, is, is guidance for legislators as they move to put in place legislation to, to, uh, to make this firmer. Uh, and uh, I think it, it is not that the medical profession in Canada is taking a firm line one way or another. It is simply saying, this is the fact. There is going to, this is going to happen. Now, if it's going to happen, this is what we need to do. And I would urge the AMA to uh, develop an a document very similar to the one that the Canadian Medical Association... Well, it probably would require a, a high court case. Their Supreme Court directed the laws had to be Correct. written. Um, Georgie, you can just perhaps give us a, a better legal description yeah, of that. It's, it's quite um, interesting, actually, to look at the Canadian decision. Um, it is heavily based on the fact that I think that the Canadians have a Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So they um, they analyse their laws in that context, which is different from us. And Malcolm and I were talking about it earlier, actually. I can't imagine our High Court giving a decision like this. And they usually what they do is um, give a decision that says, well, it's not our role, it's up to the Parliament to make decisions in this area, rather than, as you say, um, Tony, essentially directing the court that it's... They were saying it was um, the provision against... Um, or the law that says that it's illegal to assist suicide as a practitioner um, is contrary to their Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And breach, then, breach the human right of that it. particular test case patient. That's right, the patient had ALS, which yeah. I think a lot of the um, test cases in Canada seem to have patients with that sort of neurodegenerative um, situation. Mark. Which is what happened in the UK. So the House of Lords said this is a parliamentary decision. It went back to the parliament and failed. And that's what happened in Scotland. It went back to the parliament in Scotland and failed. Uh, detailed, careful thought, large, very substantial reviews, decided that in the context of the English situation, in the context of the Scottish situation, it wasn't going to work. There is no move uh, at a high court level in Australia that we should change our position. We as a profession have the opportunity to try and uh, to, to, to lead in to that. And if in fact the reason, Bob, you will choose to euthanise yourself is because our nursing home environment is so abhorrent that we're not prepared to look after. We look after our elderly so badly that, in fact, I'd rather commit suicide or be euthanised than go to a nursing home. Let's fix our nursing homes. Yes. Yes. Well, that would be good. Um, yeah, sorry, Bob. You can jump in and it, we'll just go to our next question after that. It's not because I think the nursing home situation is is appalling. It's because at that point I would feel I was in a position to decide that my, it was time to end my life. It's, it's not... It, I, I, th I think to sort of say we can fix this by simply making the nursing homes uh, a little bit better is not really the answer to the concerns that a lot of people at my Sounds stage like, have. Sounds like, in political terms, you might have to begin by campaigning for a Bill of Rights um, if the, our parliament's uh, incapable of dealing with individual rights. Well, can I just say one thing? I'm sorry, but we seem to be developing this absolute horror of needing care and assistance. Mm. And so, you know, we're all upper middle class, very well educated, powerful people who've had control over every aspect of our life, unlike the majority of the population. And the idea that somebody might have to help us go to the toilet or that we might drool or get crumbs in our cardigan is somehow horrific to us or that we might not be able to absolutely be in control of everything. And it's, it's horrific to me as well. But the thing is that um, if, if needing care and assistance is horrific, what does that say to people who need care and assistance? I mean, if we say that it's so bad that we should be allowed to get a doctor to kill us, then what about all the disabled people? What about the people who need care and assistance? Like, to care for someone now has become something that's a cost to us, and to need assistance is a horror. And we've lost all of the sense of the mutually enriching and beneficial parts of that relationship. Um, does that... 
That's a good argument, but it doesn't cope with the uh, individual choice element of things. Well, so should an, should, choice. A, should an individual choose to think differently? Okay. Um, are they being penalised by the current Th this laws? Is, this is the thing that, that's always interested me about the... the about why progressives are so into euthanasia because it's we we have choice and we have rights and I, I thought that we have a society not just a group of individuals who happen to be co-located on a chunk of land I mean your our choices as individuals affect all of society and I think that if we um, uh, give say that it's okay for some people's life to be considered not worth living, then other people in that situation, the fact that that choice exists actually does have an influence. It's not that every single choice is not influenced by social expectation, by your peers, by circumstance. I mean, choice is, doesn't actually exist in a, in a vacuum. Let's, uh, let's hear, uh, Malcolm, on that choice. Your choice will influence others in perhaps a negative way. Um, the well, option, giving that option, will it obviously has. But that had, option is choice, right? Well, if at the moment, have, there's no choice to ask a doctor so, to kill so you, you. But if we, if, you if, if we give the, that, if you change it, then you have the choice. Yes. Then that's that's the point where we're at. So I just want to ask Malcolm about that. I mean, I think uh, the idea that having a choice and making a choice that someone else may not agree with will influence them. Um, to make a choice that they would not otherwise have made can be hugely overstated. We have choice in all sorts of walks of life. Our choices and all sorts of other things influence others. What we do, our actions, influence others. This happens all the time. Um, but, so I don't, think, I don't think that's a reasonable argument to say, well, we, we, we've got all this choice, but we won't offer this particular choice. Why not? What's the difference? Of course, it'll, it'll influence people, but we're influenced all the time. Look, yeah, but we're saying that we don't want to be influencing people to feel... The, all the studies show that the main reason people request um, physician-assisted suicide is not actually... The majority of people do not request it for pain. They request it because of feelings of worthlessness and hopelessness. So if we give the choice, mm -hmm. what I'm saying is if we give the choice, then it, it will influence people. I, I, I might just make the point um, in passing that um, the Oregon laws forbid strictly what you've just said. They give the choice only to people who are classified as being terminally ill with six months to live. So you're, you're not quite right about that. I wasn't specifically talking about Oregon and I'm saying people who request, not yeah. people who get it, uh, people uh, who request, the, the, the overwhelming majority of requests, the reason is, I'm not, I, I don't, I well, don't even know if that's in Oregon. Not, it can't be true of the overwhelming majority of requests in Oregon because they have to no, go through No, I didn't even mention Oregon. Well, I, I, we yeah. meant, we're just but, talking about it earlier. But Rodney Syme would be not happy. I mean, he, he, that, well, the Oregon legislation does not suit his needs. Oh, you're right. You're absolutely right. So, it's, it's, so, it wouldn't go far enough for many advocates. That's true. Um, so, so the point about that issue is still valid, that issue of choice. The fact is, choice exists in Australia for a certain proportion of people. People who know a palliative care physician who's prepared to play around with this, this, this crazy double, double effect business. Uh, and people... Uh, who uh, have something that can be withdrawn or stopped. And, and one of the things that came out of our discussions was that this is un unequal and unfair, uh, that, that a certain group of people who, who know a palliative care physician who does uh, support euthanasia and, and is prepared to, uh, to do a Rodney Syme, so to speak, uh, have a benefit that, that others of us don't. Uh, and that the only way to make this real is to, to legislate in a way that makes this equal for everybody. Well, you assume it's a benefit to know a Rodney Syme. What if the palliative care, what if the palliative care team are able to ameliorate the suffering of the patient, but if it's a Rodney Syme, they don't attempt to? I mean, it's not a benefit necessarily. Okay, um, I'm just got, so I'm going to interrupt you both. I'm, I'm going to give a question to that side of the room because I may have not noticed you standing there for a while. I'll come back to the middle after that. Go ahead. I haven't been here too long. Uh, Louis Christie, I... Another queue jumper. Yeah, another queue jumper. <laughs> I used to work in emergency medicine and now I work in palliative care, so I've done a fair bit of hanging around death and dying. 
My question comes about the practicalities, assuming we were to develop a position statement that moves along uh, supporting some sort of, sort of physician assisted something, the practicalities of doing that. So far we've talked about the 18 year olds and we've talked about the very elderly and infirm. The trouble is not either of those groups so much when we start thinking about the practicalities of doing something. Everyone in, or not everyone, but a lot of people in this room like myself are in a situation where we can no longer do what we used to do physically or otherwise 15, 20 years ago. Um, my knee's about to give out. Um, at what point do we take someone who has chronic illness, chronic disability, slow death, slow dying, because, you know, or, or, organically speaking, I'm now over about 40, my body's dying more rapidly than it's growing. At what point do we say that person fits in the legislation, that person doesn't? My concern is that the law when we come down to the nuts and bolts of it, is going to be a very, very precise, imprecise implement, a very blunt in implement, and, and let's to try and create the sort of things that we, okay. people are hoping to create. Okay, unless it can be done with precision, and, and that's so a question as to whether it can. So, can we do Georgie, it? Georgie, can uh, laws be made with precision? Well. Well, it depends on the definitions. That's, I, I was going to get depends in. It depends. I have to give that answer as a lawyer. Um, but yeah, it depends on how it's worded. But always then, there's going to be it's going to be open to interpretation. So that's why you have these, um, you know, you have submissions and consultations and the like to look at the legislation and the wording. But no piece of legislation is ever perfect. So we've got to remember that as well. But okay, Bob, and then well, it's, it's worth pointing out that the Swiss don't have legislation at all. They simply say that provided uh, the assistance uh, is done with good intent, uh, the person who assists will not be prosecuted. Uh, and and uh, that, that's, that's at one extreme. Uh, I, like you, I'm a bit, bit hesitant about uh, locking ourselves in with a whole, a whole lot of laws. But I do think that uh, if we're going to move beyond this stupidity that we have at the moment, we do have to uh, change that, that, especially that uh, double effect thing, and say it is it is conceivable it is, that a physician may be in in a certain circumstance be able to assist his patient to die. That we won't that we will publicly decriminalise it. Now we, we've effectively done it, but but it's not fair across the country. Rod Symes doing it all the time. Uh, and, and, and publicly saying so and, and, and uh, challenging the, um, the uh, uh, prosecutors to take him to court. Uh, what, we've, what we surely need to do is make explicit in law uh, the fact that this is not a criminal act on the part of a doctor to assist his patient uh, in the best interest of that patient. OK, Mark. So, I mean, the, the question is... We've now been uh, having debate about uh, euthanasia and legislation of euthanasia since the Northern Territory, 20 years. We've practised medicine as a profession very successfully uh, with maybe there's a couple of high profile public uh, issues. And we've done that within the existing legislation very successfully without having to actually undermine 2,000 uh, 2, years of our basic ethical principles about life. So I come back to the same argument. I, don't, I think Rodney Simon wants to have a fight. Why do we need one? Um, let me just quickly uh, raise something with you. It came up in um, some research that was thrown our way, uh, the ABC, but one of the big questions is whether many doctors are already intentionally hastening the deaths of terminally ill patients. In a survey in 1999 of 683 Australian surgeons showed that 36% of them admitted they had administered drugs in greater than the amount, amounts required with the intention of hastening death. 23% of those surgeons said they did so without consulting the patient. Um, so is it already happening? And is that part of the reason why it needs to be codified in law? Well, I, I think that depends on where you see ourselves as a profession. I mean, 
We, we have uh, a very strong ethic. We have legislation such as in Queensland which says uh, we can manage the double effect uh, so long as it's consistent with good clinical practice. It's a very strong piece of legislation. Uh, I've, I've seen uh, Joanna here, so she could speak to our current uh, medical board, uh, Australian Medical Board Ethic, and this has not been challenged, and it's not challenged because, in fact, there's good communication with families, there's shared endeavour, there's shared thinking about how to deal with an issue, and we deal with it. We're doing that without having to fundamentally undermine basic professional ethic. And I think as a professional, as a doctor, if I don't have to go home every night worrying about have I actually made this right decision, dwelling on those issues, I don't think I'm doing my job. And I think we want to sterilise everything we do. We want to sterilise death because we want to make it so clean and the lawyers get involved. Then it's no longer, it's just so we don't have to think about it again. I think that's a real mistake because what it'll do is undermine what we are, which is a profession. Tony, Tony can I just yes, make yes, one can, yep. short point uh, in response to the previous question. Um, in essence, the question was about where do we draw the line? Um, that's a scope question. Who falls into the category who will qualify for assisted dying should the legislation be introduced? As Tony indicated earlier, um, uh, Oregon has put very heavy dark lines around the, around, around the boundary. Um, terminal illness, six months to live, uh, prognosis and so on. So. There are scope questions there, clearly. The th one of the essential features of the law, whichever a a category of the law you look at, uh, lines have to be drawn which cannot be that good. They're, they're often always fuzzy. Think of negligence uh, litigation. Think of all sorts of different areas where judgments are made, not on, numeric on a numerical basis, um, but it's a judgment. Um, so I don't think that argument, and I'm not suggesting you're putting this argument against legislation, um, but I don't think that uh, if, it, if it is put as an argument, oh, we can't draw lines, we can't circumscribe things adequately, so we shouldn't have it. I don't think that runs. Okay, let's try and get through these questions. Um, the people have been patiently lined up here. Um, we've got three of them. We haven't got a lot of time, so I might just go, go to individuals or one or two people. Thank go ahead. You. Thank goodness. I was about to request euthanasia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> My, Michael Glixman, uh, I'm a physician, but I'm going to come at this as a patient. Mm -hmm. uh, about six to eight months ago at a Sydney, major Sydney hospital where I'm well known, um, for positive reasons I hope, I ended up in accident and emergency. I was convinced what I had was an SVT that was recalcitrant and dropped my blood pressure through my boots. But the moment the staff saw me, there was panic. Um, you, know, you don't go to hospital if you're reasonably well known there. Uh, and uh, the diagnosis was cardiogenic shock. Uh, eventually their panic was infectious and I started to think maybe they're right. Uh, my family came in, I said my goodbyes to them and it reverted. What uh, that taught me uh, was that I was not afraid to die, not at all, but I am really concerned about the manner of that death. And as a doctor, and as every doctor here, I have the choice as to how I'm going to die. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to commit suicide if you don't want. You don't have to euthanise yourself. Um, but I can, and every doctor here can make that choice. The only people who are denied are our patients. And uh, I think that is indefensible. And sorry, that's a statement. It's a rhetorical question. But it's question. one worth getting a response to. So, um, Karen, it's, it has come up time and time again. Um, Doctors can do it, patients can't. Well, yes, they can. I'm, yeah. I don't understand why you said... Well, not, well, not, um, not well, unless they, they illegally get access to them. themselves. Yeah. What knowledge do they well, have to do it Well, then why do we have such rate? high suicide rates? I mean, so, look, so we, we can do that ourselves. I just don't think that's an argument for meaning that everyone well, should be I'm able afraid. to have I access to drugs. I think it is drugs. an argument, and it's not everyone. Uh, there are strict limits to it. Um, it works in other countries. Well, who, uh, who you should, make your choice. Who should? I, I, you make your choice. Well, well, no, you make your choice. But to mm -hmm. make it for others when you can make your own choice, I think is so you, uh, pretty you, offensive. So anyone can come to you and ask for the drug I think, and give I it think to I them. just mentioned under strict legislative guidelines, as is done overseas. And who will decide what? 
What? We can't do. We can't do what. We just can't take our own. Hang on, he's asking questions. We we, we can't be cross examining him. No, no, no. I'm not. You'd have to be sorry. You're being cross examined by our panel. Uh, but, Mark, but that's I, all right. I, I can return it just as well right, uh, because there's a tremendous amount of hypocrisy I, I, going on. I think this is. I, I think that's completely wrong. I, I, you know what? I mean, I'm a geriatrician, so what am I going to get access to? I mean, I can't just go and prescribe myself propofol. I can't go and just prescribe myself morphine. You don't know the combination of drugs you can prescribe uh, and get a hold. But of I mean, to that's kill all yourself. like you're a very well, ignorant physician. Well, uh, thank you for that. Um, you're welcome. Uh, and, and I'm very pleased that I, I don't actually have that skill set our palliative care physicians have. But that, that, this argument is like saying, oh, well, you doctors can do it and you're not going to allow the rest of the community to do it. I think that's a senseless argument. But at a, at a broader level, the argument beyond whether you can prescribe or not prescribe for yourself, the argument is do you get to make decisions for individual patients? So bring in Bob uh, because he has a very different view to you. Well, I, I, th I think I've expressed it already. I, I do think that the patient needs to have control over their, t their, their time of dying and their kind of dying. We, we have taken that from them, uh, except for a rather small proportion of people, including doctors, and Mark kids himself if he doesn't know how he could kill himself, uh, uh, very, very painlessly and very easily. Um, we, we've taken that away from the community and, and said, well, we'll keep it in the hands of the profession uh, who will use this silly double effect business. Well, we haven't taken anything away from the community. What have we taken away? We haven't taken... Choice. We, we haven't taken never away... No, in, never in history have human beings been able to choose when they live, when they die. The manner of we that can death now we have taken away from them. We have taken the well, choice Did they have it the before? We, they didn't have it before. Would we, what we think now, we can control everything else in our life so that we should be able to demand a caesarean section were, death now as well. Is that our right? Drugs which most were not people, prescription drugs mm -hmm. are now prescription drugs. We have okay. taken that right. Most okay. people in the world, I just want to say one yes, thing, you, most you can, people gonna, we'll cannot, final comment. I'm sorry don't actually questions. have choice over many, many aspects of their life that some people don't have somewhere to live. Some people don't have the choice of a job. Some people don't have the choice of dinner for that and night. That's okay. And that's completely outrageous. Yes. But I just think maybe you just don't have the choice to die cleanly and exactly when you want. Maybe we just don't. We do have that choice. It's been taken away. Okay, I'm going to leave that there. Um, there's an interesting balance of arguments. I'm sorry to our other questioners because I was told when Michael Gannon loomed above me like the Grim Reaper that it'd be time to stop the <laughs> questions. And there he is, lo and behold. Oh, thanks for nothing, Tony. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, can I... Metaphorically speaking. Yeah, metaphorically. Can I please uh, uh, start by asking you all to, uh, uh, to thank Tony Jones for his uh, outstanding professional job.